All right, ladies and gentlemen, so this is going to be our first video clip that we're going to talk about geologic history. We're going to do a little review of what we've already covered. So we've already covered the order of superposition, which states that the oldest layers are on the bottom and the youngest layers are on the top if the layers haven't been overturned. We talked about original horizontality, where you have sedimentary layers being deposited. Uh, they can only be turned into rock horizontally. So therefore, if they're not horizontal, something must have moved them. So the superposition, sedimentary sequence, will be the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on the top, and if undisturbed. The next thing we're going to talk about is what's called cross-cutting relationships. Now this is a note you want to make in your notebook. Anything that cuts across a layer is younger than the layer it cuts across. Anything that cuts across a layer is younger than the layer it cuts across. The analogy I always use is kind of like making a sandwich. So first you make a sandwich, you put down a piece of bread, then you put down a piece of lunch meat, then you put down a piece of cheese, then you put some lettuce, then you put some tomato, then you put a little mayonnaise, and then you put another slice of bread. So the last piece of bread is the youngest, and the first piece of bread is the oldest. Now you take a knife, and you cut your sandwich in half. So once you cut your sandwich in half, it has been cut, but it had to be made before you could cut it. So therefore, the cut is the youngest thing. So anything that cuts across a layer is younger than the layer it cuts across. Can you think of some things that could cut across a layer? Some things we've already talked about. Well, a fault is an example of something that would cut across a layer. So where layers are offset. An igneous intrusion could cut across a layer. Also, any piece of rock that's within another rock has to be older than the rock it's in. It just makes sense. So if you have a sedimentary rock, the sediments in the rock have to be older than that particular sedimentary rock itself. So if we look at a cross-section of rocks, you see that the oldest is on the bottom and the youngest is on the top. Now in igneous intrusion, this occurs when magma makes its way through surrounding pre-existing country rock. It's called cold country rock. When that happens, what's one thing you can remember that that hot molten material does to the surrounding rock? Contact metamorphism. It causes contact metamorphism. So there has to be a point where the rock stops melting, but the heat is enough to change the surrounding rock. So therefore, you're going to have an igneous intrusion. Next to it, you're going to have contact metamorphism. And then next to it, you're going to have the rock that it intruded through. So therefore, if contact metamorphism is present, that means the igneous intrusion is younger than the layer it cuts across. Because anything that cuts across a layer is younger than the layer it cuts across. So if we look at a diagram like this, we have sedimentary layers here. Then we have an igneous intrusion. We have another igneous intrusion. And we have a fault over here. But notice this igneous intrusion is not cut by this fault. So this igneous intrusion cuts across the fault. So therefore, the igneous intrusion is younger than the layers it cuts across. And this igneous intrusion cuts across everything, so therefore it must be younger than the layers it cuts across. So the youngest thing in this diagram is this igneous intrusion right here. Now the one thing that's not shown on this diagram is contact metamorphism. These little red tick marks here would represent contact metamorphism. And since this layer 
cut all the way across all the other layers, there should be contact metamorphism marked all along this layer. Now this layer here, this layer here could have contact metamorphism on the top and the bottom. That would tell me that that igneous intrusion occurred while this layer was here. If it doesn't have contact metamorphism on the top, but only on the bottom, that tells me that the igneous intrusion occurred and then this layer was deposited afterwards. So this is what's called sequence of events. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are on the bypass outside of Kingston, known as Koenig Boulevard. What we're looking at here is what's called the anticline syncline complex. These are sedimentary rocks. We know that they have been folded because normally sedimentary rocks form horizontally, but these guys are not horizontal anymore. They're tilted, as you can see. There's a big up and down movement. There's also some unique features in here that are noteworthy, like the white lines going through it. That's uh, considered calcite veins. What that means is that the rocks formed, then they were folded, and as they folded, you got these cracks, which the open cracks are called joints, and then from the joints, what happened is the hydrothermic fluids of calcite flowed into the cracks. So therefore, the cracks are younger than the rocks. The veins are younger than the cracks. Now, if we look at the order of superposition, our lowest rocks are the oldest ones and our youngest rocks are the top ones. If we look on our reference tables, you'll see brachiopods such as Mucrospirifer that are indicative of these layers. These are limestone, sandstone, siltstone layers that vary. You can see the, the changes in them and they have been distorted due to folding due to plate tectonics. So here we are on Route 209-199, the approach for the kingston Rhinecliff Bridge. These are the same complex, the anticline syncline complex that I showed you about two miles away. And if you look, you can actually see that this is the axis of the anticline and you can see it sloping from downward here, going upward, and then going back down. Now, if you look at that, you can also see the various layers. Again, these have not been overturned. So the oldest is on the bottom, the youngest is on the top, which is the law of superposition. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're on... Route 9W, about two miles north, and this is the backside of that anticline where it slopes down and meets the road. This layer here is actually the one that gives us the fossils to tell us how old these rocks are. So if we take a look, a real close look at these guys, this layer here, it actually is the most fossiliferous layer in New So if we take a look at this, we can see the slope of the hill going up and the layers coming down on the angle. That's the back side of the anticline that we saw out on Route 209-199, New York State. So if you look closely, you can actually see that these are all seashells, a whole bunch of seashells that make up the whole layer. And let's see if we can't get a piece off of it. Here you can see some more of the seashells. This is a brachiopod. This is the mucrospirifer that I'm talking about. This is a pretty cool piece here because if you look at all those little things that look like straws stacked together, they're actually crinoid stems that are all together and the rock around it is worn away. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so you are going to stop the recording here. You're going to complete the lab activity in Google Classroom on sequence of events. Make sure when you're writing down the sequence of events, you include folding, 
which is also tilting, faulting, igneous intrusions, veins, joints, and unconformities. You may have the same rock type twice. Make sure you label it twice. Write your answers and submit it into Google Classroom. Next, we're going to talk about unconformities and the steps in forming an unconformity. An unconformity is a buried erosional surface. A buried erosional surface represents a gap in geologic time. What that means is that weathering and erosion have happened and worn away layers that represent missing pieces of the story that we're trying to piece together. Now, if we take and we look at these rock layers, we see that they're tilted. They're sedimentary layers, and on top of them is a horizontal layer. So this squiggly line right here represents the unconformity. Notice that the bedding planes of the sedimentary layers are here and here, but there are also some that are vertical. Now remember, the law of original horizontality states that sedimentary rocks form horizontally. So what must have happened was these sedimentary layers over here were deposited first. Then there was tilting or folding, which caused an uplift. That then was exposed to the atmosphere and the erosional surface happened right here causing an unconformity then subsidence below sea level and more sedimentary rocks were deposited on top these two layers here then another event of tilting and uplift occurred which then tilted these two rock layers. Weathering and erosion happened because it was exposed to the surface. Then subsidence happened again. It went below sea level and more sediments were deposited on top of that. That is what causes an angular unconformity. If we look at a very famous unconformity, we have if you guys recognize this, these are the cliffs in New Paltz. And the unconformity forms between the shale and then you have that very hard quartz cap rock that causes the cliff. And if you remember me talking about cliffs and how they form, you have to have a very hard rock on top that's resistant to weathering and a less resistant rock underneath that wears away creating the cliff. So, with this situation, you had the shale being deposited, then the shale was uplifted. Now, you can't see it here, but this shale is very distorted. Then it was eroded, so this is your unconformity. Then it was subsided below sea level. And then this layer of quartz was deposited. Then it was uplifted again. Then it was subsided again, and actually in between here, there's a very thin layer of shale. You don't really see it, but if you know the geology of the area, you'll know it. And shale is a deep water sediment, so that means it went quite a ways underwater. Then it was uplifted again and eroded, and then subsided again, and the second quartz layer was deposited. And obviously because we can see these cliffs. It has been uplifted again. And sometimes in the future, this surface here is going to become an unconformity. Remember, it's very, very hard cap rock. It's a quartz pebble conglomerate. So hard that it's used for cutting wheels. These are old grinding stones and wheels used for grinding flour and sharpening axes. 
They actually used to cut them out of this rock. This is located in New Paltz, and you guys are located down in Monroe, right about here. So the red line represents the Schwangunk Mountains, and this red arrow shows where you guys live. So you're not too far away from these cliffs. And you can see the top layer of quartz there, then there's that line there, and that's the layer between the two quartz layers, and then down here is your shale. And one of the things you can find in there are the New York State fossil Eurypterids, which is an example of an index fossil. An index fossil is a fossil that lived for a relatively short period of time and was found over a wide geographic area. Now, if we take a look at the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon has a whole series of different types of unconformities. Unconformities have three major types. They have what's called a non-conformity, where you have non-sedimentary rocks that have been uplifted and eroded, with sedimentary rocks deposited on top of them. You have what's called an angular unconformity. An angular unconformity is where you have tilted sedimentary beds or folded sedimentary beds with horizontal sedimentary beds deposited on top of them. So, the sequence of events in the formation of an unconformity is that the lower sediments were deposited as horizontal layers in a body of water. Most sedimentary rocks are deposited in water. Then, the lower sediments were raised above water level and tilted during a tectonic event. Then erosional forces at the Earth's surface, so they were exposed to the atmosphere. They carved the layers. So it looks something like this. You have first your sedimentary layers being deposited underwater. Here's the water. Then you have a tectonic force that causes your folding. That then is eroded away. See the fold is eroded down to this uneven surface. That's why unconformities are represented by a squiggly line. Then they go back underwater again and new layers are deposited on top of it. So then the land surface subsided again and more sediments were deposited on top of the erosional surface and just like being in class the telephone interrupts the lesson so i don't know who just got called down to the office i think it was my wife so the next thing in the series is that new sediments are deposited on the erosional surface and the last thing is that they're back uplifted again, so now we can see them. And this is what causes the formation of an unconformity. So the sequence of events, remember, sedimentary layers are deposited underwater. So in that sequence of events, there must be some subsidence. Now in your homework assignment in the lab, you don't have to include the term subsidence. You just have to talk about the layer that was deposited. 